over a week ago that I saw Kong Skull Island, and I wanted to review the movie. Now, the original King Kong is my favorite movie of all time. You know, uh, I think it's really one of the greatest movies ever made. You know, I, I'm a fan of Citizen Kane, but I enjoy King Kong much more, even though Citizen Kane is also a lot of fun. It's an enjoyable movie. Um, there's just something incredible about King Kong, the original uh, 1933 King Kong. It's, it's just, you know, ever since <laughs> movie, that's just a beloved movie. Now, that being said, uh, I did not, definitely did not like the first time I saw it, the 1976 GPS remake signal lost. of King Kong. That was a big disappointment to me when I finally got around to seeing it. I remember I bought it uh, VHS and I was just very, very uh, disappointed with it. I think I only actually watched it. So I bought the VHS because I wanted to, to own all the King Kong movies. Um, as opposed to other you know, movies in the Kong, you know, cannot King Kong movies or official King Kong movies like King Kong vs. Godzilla is a fun movie. King Kong Escapes also a fun movie. Not that serious, but definitely a lot of fun. Um, now, uh, and I remember also taping off of TBS King Kong Lives, which was the sequel to the 76 King Kong. It came out 10 years later in 86. Um, I remember taping that off TV, and that movie I did enjoy. It wasn't as, um, you know, uptight and full of itself as the 76 King Kong. I realized that it wasn't a good movie. I think that's part of um, GPS signal the lost. appeal of this movie was that, you know, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't trying to be a good movie. It knew it was a B movie. Um, just like, you know, King Kong Lives and, I mean, King Kong Escapes and King Kong vs. Godzilla also were movies that, you know, were self-aware of their goofiness, you know. Uh, Son of Kong, also a fun movie. Um, I think it's that right, uh, that right balance, really, Son of Kong, because on one hand, it's extremely realistic. It starts out like smacking you in the face with the realism of what just happened in King Kong. And like, you know, they, that Carl Denham is facing lawsuits and, you know, facing indictment and how he runs away and so forth. Um, so, there, so, you know, there's... And then it goes back into the fantasy world of Skull Island. Um, but up until they get to Skull Island, it's realistic, gritty, um, but also fun movie, Son of Kong. I know a lot of people are like, oh, it's not as good as the original. Of course it isn't, but it's, it's a fun little movie, and it's short, which makes it, you know, a nice way to spend a little over an hour, which is really nice. Now, um, those are all the canonical or official King Kong movies. Of course, there's also Mighty Joe Young, um, which is, you know, not officially a King Kong movie, but it's made by the same people as the original Kong, uh, and, you know, has some of the original cast and so forth. That's, you know, within the Kong genre without being in the Kong universe in a way, you know. Um, and then you have all the rip-offs, you know, which I really don't even remember watching a full one of the the rip-offs, you know, in the 70s, there were all those rip-offs, I've never watched any of those, so I don't really have any comment on those, but I understand, you know, some were better than others, and some were really, really bad. Uh, well, that being said, then you have the 2005 remake. Now, I'll be honest, I didn't see it in the theaters, um, I, I got the DVD and I watched it, and I personally enjoyed it because I feel it's a, an homage to the original, although I know some people really, really hate that movie. Um, you know, the hatred that I had for the 76 King Kong was unparalleled. Now I'm trying to give it a second chance. It's on Hulu, and I, I'm half 
through it, and I'll probably try to watch the rest of it, you know, and I realize, all right, it's not as bad as I thought, but I just felt it was insulting to the grandeur of the original film. Um, and also because it was so full of itself, and now as far as the 05 film, which was also full of itself, but I enjoyed it because it was an homage to the original, um, you know, it definitely fit in uh, to a lot of the things the original changed certain things. It was dreadfully long, that's for sure. Um, and the original was pretty long, as far as especially movies back then would go. Uh, but it, I enjoyed it. The only main complaint I had about it was Jack Black. I'm not a big fan of Jack Black. I don't dislike him. But he's not Robert Armstrong. He doesn't fit in that role of Carl Denham. And But then I was thinking, nobody's really Robert Armstrong. You know, that's what I was thinking all the time since I saw that movie. Nobody's really Robert Armstrong. Now I see Skunk, Kong Skull Island. And I realize there is an actor today who probably would have, in my opinion, been a better... Carl Denham for the Peter Jackson film, and that is John Goodman, and it I only struck me now of how good of an actor John Goodman is, I mean, you know, I liked him in um, The Artist, but what I really remember him from when I was a kid was Matinee, and in the movie Matinee, which was 1993 or 1994, they're about... So I was a little kid when that came out, and I saw that in the theater. Um, and that movie, first of all, is an homage to all the 50s and early 60s sci-fi and horror monster movies. It directly references a lot of movies, you know, I remember they took lines from, like, Beginning of the End, the Bird Eye Gordon movie. I'm looking forward to Monster Bash so I can actually meet Bird Eye Gordon. Um, you know, I have his, uh, his book, uh, autographed. I, I got that from him, but, you know, now he's going to be at Monster Bash this year. I missed the last time he came. Um, he had something to, you know, and they only announced at last minute that he was coming, and I had a wedding that day, and I really regretted not getting to meet him, and now that he's going to be at Monster Bash, I'm really looking forward to that. You know, we hope he'll be healthy and well, um, for that. I mean, there's so many great people who are going to be at Monster Bash this year. I mentioned Mighty Joe Young, so Terry Moore is going to be there. That's, you know, if you are anywhere, you know, within, you know, 800 miles of Pittsburgh, you know, it's worthwhile to go out to Monster Bash if you're a fan of the old monster movies like I am. I mean, this is... You know, this is really one of the few things that me and my family, we go away. Um, it's our, like, only vacation for the year. It's a, a weekend. It's very affordable. Um, you know, there's motels. You know, the hotel there where it is is sold out, but there's other motels around it which are pretty affordable. And then you have, and the tickets to the show are very affordable. And it's just the best convention I've ever been, I, well, I haven't really been to a lot of conventions, but I can't say enough good things about Monster Bash, and, like, I'm just excited about who's going to be there this year. Like I mentioned, Bird Eye Gordon, Terry Moore, and um, Larry Storch is going to be there. He was supposed to be there, and he he wasn't well one time, and I was going to go, he had a birthday party this year, I was thinking of going, uh... I wasn't going to go in the end, but like our car broke down that day, but like I was thinking of going, whatever, and, but it wasn't really my scene, you know, I knew it wasn't going to be something I would enjoy really, but to go and meet him at Monster Bash, I'm really looking forward to that, you know, because I'm a big fan of F Troop, um, so looking forward to that, but going back to Kongsko Island, John Goodman, like I said, he was in this movie Matinee, and the character he played was really based pretty much on William Castle. It was an homage to William Castle. And William Castle, in a way, was like a real-life Carl Denham figure, in a way, not with the adventure ways how Marion C. Cooper actually was in real life. And, like, if you actually learn about the life of Marion C. Cooper, it'll 
blow your mind. It, it's like he was real life, you know, Indiana Jones, you know, adventure guy, a real life Carl Denham. Like he was like, you know, a very interesting figure in history. Um, fascinating person and uh, also with a lot of admirable traits if you, you know, learn about, you know, how he, you know, with World War II, he, like, sold his business because he didn't want to seem like he was profiting off the war because it was useful to the war effort something, and so he didn't want to, like, he didn't want to seem like he's, you know, he's profiting from the war, and instead he re-enlisted in the army and served with great honor um, and distinction um, in World War II and in World War One. Really incredible person, uh, Marion C. Cooper. But anyway, um, you know, thinking about John Goodman in Matinee, I realized he would have been the perfect choice in 2005. That would have made the movie so much better if, you know, nothing personal against Jack Black, but, um, but John Goodman really would have been a perfect Carl Denham. He's probably the closest thing that we have today that I can think of to someone like Robert Armstrong, you know. So that's just my take on uh, on this. And so by choosing him in a kind of a similar Carl Denham type of character, um, they really righted that wrong in a way in uh, Kong Skull Island. So now I'm going to start talking about Kong Skull Island. Um, so spoiler alert, I might talk about some spoilers. That was one of the main things I really wanted to bring up was uh, how I felt that John Goodman was cast wonderfully in this and he would have been a perfect pick. I mean, almost in this movie, because it's less of a serious movie, Jack Black could have actually been better in this movie uh, if, you know, if John Goodman had been in the first movie. Um, although John Goodman is the perfect pick for this movie, but if John Goodman had been in the 2005 movie, um, and they, it would have been redundant to cast him in this movie, maybe for this movie Jack Black would have been a, a good pick. Um, because it is less of a serious movie. It is more self-aware of being a B-movie, even though it's beautifully shot, it's well cast, but it's like a big budget B-movie, basically. Um, it has a pretty flimsy story, um, a nice story, an enjoyable story, but it's nothing really major. It's not a... It's not a wow movie the way, you know, the original King Kong was, even though the original King Kong was just trying to be a good movie. It wasn't a B movie. It was definitely an A movie. You know, I remember the, uh, seeing a, a trailer from the 1938 re-release, and they said this is what movies were made for, and that's GPS exactly... GPS signal lost. That's exactly what King Kong is. That's what movies were made for. Um, the original 33 King Kong. This movie is much more of... A programmer B movie, but with a big budget and with a great cast, um, and it's a lot of fun. But it's again, it's not a deep movie that you're going to think about. You know, what is the social commentary here? Even though there is some social commentary, and certainly I enjoy the fact that it's a historical uh, fiction that you know starts off with World War II, goes to Vietnam. I'm a big history buff. Um, so that aspect of the film definitely appeals to me. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm def as a religious person, I'm uncomfortable with the level of cursing in the movie, but I understand they want it to be realistic. And it definitely is realistic, and it's not over the top. Um, and uh, it, it's not exploitive. It's, it fits in uh, the same thing, the violence is quite shocking on one hand, but on the other hand, it's not exploitative, it's realistic and, um, and appropriate for the film, especially trying to, you know, capture that Vietnam era, you know, grittiness and so forth. So it, it really is, you know, most of the characters don't really fit into the 70s, except that one guy with the mustache and the afro, like, he looks like a 70s guy, you know, a lot of these other characters, they, 
they're trying a little bit, you know, but it doesn't really matter because they do a pretty good job. Um, and, you know, John C. Riley is great, and, and it's really his story. You know, basically the, the story arc and the plot of the movie is really surrounding him, and, uh, and he's really probably the best... Uh, part of the movie, you know, his character and, and you know, their, uh, their whole, you know, his whole story of how he got expanded in World War II, and, you know, things like that did happen, there, there were soldiers who were MIA, not on Monster Island as far as we know, but there were MIA soldiers, you know, who were discovered later and didn't know the war ended and things like that, you know, and there were Twilight Zone episodes about this, I mean, you know, the these type of things, it's nothing so special, it's nothing so incredible, it's obviously just a movie to set up for the Godzilla vs. King Kong movie, and you know, uh, has some great easter eggs for for the uh, King Kong fans, you know, King Kong nerds like me, you know, one thing was um, how the, you know, he points out the shipwreck, and he's like, this must have been about 10 years before I came, and he came in 44, so that brings you back to 34, which is just a year after 33, so it's about the same time, and the interesting thing is, is that in the original movie, the ship was called the Venture, and, um, and here we see it's called the Wanderer, but it has the chains, so, you know, and he gets caught in the chains, so that's an homage to 33. What actually was that there was a novel that came out just before the movie came out in 33 by Edgar Wallace and Marion C. Cooper, and, you know, uh, Ruth Rose helped on it, and there was one other, Lovelace was the other one who helped to, uh, to make this novel, and in the novel, lost. the name of the ship was The Wanderer, and so that's where the name was taken from, so it is, um, you know, an homage to that. So many things are just, you know, taken right out of the other movies, the, the circle of uh, fog around the island, that's from the 76 King Kong, um, throwing... Uh, throwing trees at helicopters that you see in uh, King Kong Escapes. Um, the octopus, you know, they call them uh, Meyer squid in the, you know, website. Um, that's, you know, seems to be, a, you know, pointing to the original King Kong versus Godzilla in 62, 63. Um, I mean, what else do we have of these movies? Uh, you know, the fact that the ship was shipwrecked, kind of, you know, that the Wanderer was shipwrecked, kind of pointing um, to Son of Kong. You know, even though obviously this is not in the same universe as the 33 King Kong, because nobody seems to know about... Um, I mean, it's like an alternate universe of that, that, you know, like, what if, you know, they didn't bring Kong to New York and just, you know, or was there just some government cover-up in the 30s, you know, of this whole disaster that took place in 1933? I don't know. I mean, that's, that's a little far-fetched, so it's more likely that, you know, this is like an alternate history that, like, if they never, um... You know, if, let's say, Carl Denham got there, but it was just everyone got eaten and they never went back, you know. Um, it's basically, you know, what this seems to be pointing to. Uh, Samuel Jackson's character is kind of a reference to, I don't remember the name of the, I mean, other people have said this to the, um, the, uh, General in, um, what's the name of that movie? In King Kong Lives. So, possible reference there. So, uh, all in all, it's a fun movie. It's not a deep movie. It's not a deep thinking movie. It's, it's not a very special movie, but it's a lot of fun and it's very well made, even though it's not tremendously well written. It's not poorly written either. It's just a nice, fun, has some touching moments. Certain things, you know, again, I want to say, you know, as a religious person, are uncomfortable, you 
know, especially certain things in the beginning when they're still in Vietnam, are not really for kids, although it might go over their heads. It's, you know, thankfully there's no nudity, there's no uh, inappropriate situations, it's uh, other than some suggestions in the, in the beginning. Um, so that's, it's, but it's very violent and there is cursing, so it's not really, you know, it's not really for kids, but it's, um, but still, you know, kids might enjoy it, you know, it depends, you have to know your kids, you have to know what you're willing to expose them to, um, you know, a more pious person wouldn't, um, but all in all, it's an enjoyable, fun little movie, it's not too long, which is great, um, and that's really just about it, you know, um, in a quarter so, mile, continue on to Pennsylvania yeah, 33 North, I, I know, like, uh, Dark Corners, which is one of my favorite, uh, YouTube channels, uh, they said, you know, that he didn't want to see Kong Skull Island, and they took a poll, to, and, and he won, that he wouldn't have to see it, and, uh, you know, I, it's, I feel, I told him he didn't have to see it, you know, that's, I voted he didn't have to see it, but I would have loved that he did see it. Continue on Pennsylvania 33 North for two miles. And reviewed it, that would have been, I would, because I, you know, it would have been fun to hear his review of it. Um... But I understand why he's not interested in it. Um, you know, he really did not like the 05 King Kong. And he, you know, he had the career of Kong, a great video, um, where he talks about the whole history of, you know, the official King Kong movies. Um, but anyway, you know, it's a fun movie. It's an exciting movie. I, it's the first movie I ever saw in 3D in the theater. Um, that was really awesome. Um, you know, I mean, I'd seen, you know, the, the blue, green, you know, blue, red, or green and red, or blue and red 3D glasses types things, you know, like, uh, you know, on VHS tapes I had, which were always kind of difficult to see, but this was, like, really good, this was done very well, and, um, you know, I kind of regret I didn't see other movies in 3D, like Star Wars and stuff, you know, but... Definitely, you know, if you enjoy the King Kong movies, as I do, you're not going to be... GPS signal lost. Um, you're not going to be disappointed in this movie the way, like, for example, a lot of people are disappointed by, uh, by the 76 King Kong. It's more along the lines of something like, you know, King Kong vs. Godzilla, that type of thing. All right, well, thank you for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe, and uh, I look forward to um, to, to discussing. In a quarter there. mile, keep right to stay on US 209 North. Follow signs for I-80 East, Stroudsburg. I mean, give me some comments. Um, you know, I, I'd love to continue this conversation uh, in the comments section below. Tell keep me right to stay on US 209 North. You know, if you saw uh, Constable Island, thought of it, um, you know, I would give it something like three stars, you know, three out of five stars, like it's a good movie, or even three out of four stars. Continue on US 209 North um, for four miles. You know, it's a good movie, but it's, it's a fun movie, it's not like a great movie, it's not like a, but it's not a bad movie, it's like a fun B-movie type of thing, it would be like, you know, it reminds me in a way of a lot of like Roger Corman's type of movies, which, especially the plot would be like something Roger Corman would do. And the thing was, was Roger Corman didn't have these budgets. And so that shows, you know, the brilliance of Corman. Because um, he's, you know, like how he was able to make a movie like this, basically, not with the special effects, um, but basically everything but the special effects uh, and the budget he would make movies like this in a couple of days, and, you know, in a way, it kind of seems like a Corman movie, in a, in a way, it almost seems like an homage, you know, it's interesting, because Corman, in 76, was thinking of making a, his own King Kong movie, because, um, there was, a, you know, claims that the novel was in public domain, um, what that, 
was relate in relation to whether or not to make a movie uh, because there was uh, Universal wanted to make a King Kong movie set in the 30s in 76 and um, there was a whole uh, lawsuit over that in the end only the 76 King Kong got made in, in a way that 05 King Kong was kind of that King Kong movie that, that was supposed to be made and I, I would have probably enjoyed that one but on the other hand again you know a lot of times in the 70s when they remade movies it was the whole point was just you know to remake the same especially you know the 30s type movies that they remade in the 70s like the front page and stuff like that it was like you know we're just going to do the same movie but add cursing you know, add four-letter words. I mean, that's exactly what the front page was when they remade the front page in, in the 70s. Um, and the front page is a great... It's a great play. I mean, His Girl Friday was probably the best version of the front page. But, you know, Ben Hecht is always great. Charlie McCarthy, uh, you know, uh, Charles MacArthur. And, um, but Ben Hecht, you know, you can't go wrong with Ben Hecht. Uh, and especially, he wrote Perfidy also, you know. So, uh, I mean, so, that being said, you know, uh, like I said, I, I don't usually give, you know, ratings for these type of movies or anything, but I would give Kong Skull like, three stars. Whether it's three stars out of four stars or three stars out of five stars, I would still give it three stars, no matter what it was. Um, because that's, it, it, it might even be, like, a two and a half stars type of movie, um, but... Because, like, if it was just based on the story and the script, it's rather, it's a B-movie. It's not that good. But the acting, the cast, the special effects, the action is great fun. It's not deep. It's nothing, nothing to write home about. But, um, you know, it's not the spiritual experience like I was talking about the Star Wars movies. Um... And I'm kind of disappointed at it because, you know, I try to find spirituality when I go to the movies. I try to find God when I go to the movies. Um, there are certain spiritual elements to the movies, but it's just... The movie is thankfully short. I like that about the movie. So, you know... I mean, you know, like a movie like... Um, uh, uh, Rogue One, especially Jeddah, was just... Um, was Yerushalayim, you know, was Mecca or Jerusalem or anything, you know, and so the spirituality of that was immense and intense. This movie, you know, all right, so the like there's a Vardazara of Khan, you know, and, and these people and in a quarter of, mile, merge onto I 80 East, you know, um, all right, it's it's something, but it's not it's not my type, it's not really, you know, doesn't speak to me as deeply. You know, the one thing that I disliked about the movie is, again, this whole, which I mentioned in another video, this whole environmentalist, leftist topic, you know, like, we don't belong it's, it's in a way, it's kind of anti-humanist. Continue uh, on I-80 East for four miles you know, view of the world, anti-human view of the world, you know, it's, it comes very much from the bleak, evolutionary, uh, Darwinian ideology of, um, that's really human negative, in a way, and that is definitely something that is uncomfortable to me, but I noticed that they didn't play it up as much in the film as they did in the trailers. You know, there was some mention of this, we don't belong here, you shouldn't have come here, you know, that type of thing. You know, there's the, you know, and, and I don't like films that try to impose an ideology that's different than mine. However, on the other hand, it doesn't really impose it as much, you know, and I'm open-minded enough to explore different ideas. It helps me kind of to understand my own approach, my own, you know, Weltschang, my own world outlook on the world and religious outlook on the world. Uh, and so certainly it negates a biblical worldview. Um, but of course, it's a fantasy film. It's not meant to be taken that seriously. Um, but 
that uh, that is something you know you should be aware of when you're watching a film like this, especially if you want to maintain a biblical worldview, and that's something that's valuable to you. Don't let you know if you're going to watch a movie like this for fun. And like I often say, you know, you can thank God for the feeling of fun of watching the movie. Despite that, um, yeah, we don't get carried away, you know. Don't. In and, two and, miles, take exit 309 for US 209 North Pennsylvania 447 North toward Marshall's Creek. And in a certain sense, um, when you watch these movies and you recognize the message and it's something that you don't want to embrace that's a message you don't want to embrace and you're cognizant of that and you're mindful of that it really does elevate in a sense the movie watching experience because it doesn't you don't let yourself get carried away in the message of the film but rather you can compartmentalized to enjoy the film um, as it is. I mean, I saw a whole discussion, as someone said from the Huffington Post, of how King Kong is basically racist. And the thing is, is that in general, first of all, Marion C. Cooper and, and Ernest B. Schultzak, they were always upset when people tried GPS to signal lost. think too much into King Kong, the original King Kong. They were like, it's just a movie. Don't think that much about it. Um, that was their approach to the film. Uh, even though so many people have thought about it, you know, it reminds me of what Moshe Weinberger told us in high school. He's like, you know, the difference between, you know, Torah, which has all the depth that's intended in it. Um, that every homily that we make was given to Moses at Sinai in some sense, whether that means it literally or it means it figuratively or in potential. That's something else. Um, but, you know, like he said, you know, people were interviewing, you know, Simon and Garfunkel, like, wow, your lyrics are so deep, and does it mean this, does it mean that? And, and like, they were like, well, uh, you know, uh, you know, like, Paul Simon was like, oh, I was just thinking about my girlfriend, you know, like, uh, you know, like, like how Moshe Weinberger, he said, you know, like, imagine, you know, people go to, to, to Shakespeare, and they're like, you know, Bill, what were you thinking when you wrote, you know, the, the 13th sonnet, and you know, like, it's like, yeah, I don't know how to sell this book and make money, you know, that's why I was thinking, you know, I wasn't thinking anything so deep like you're imagining, um, so the same thing is with King Kong, like, quarter mile, continue on to Pennsylvania 447 North, you know, people imagine depth to this movie that doesn't exist, that wasn't intended, but, you know, perhaps there's a certain level of Seattle de Shmaya, even in art, that, um, you know, God inspires artists to create art for a certain reason, to bring out certain messages. That's certainly uh, possible. Um, I mean, certainly I believe in a tremendous level of, of uh, divine providence um, in general uh, to the point that would fit into that. So, um, you know, that's not not so far-fetched, um, but anyway, the, um, the real idea, what I had here, was to say, uh, you know, that in this, um, Huffington Post, they were saying, oh, you know, you're feeding into racism by continuing, you know, the King Kong genre and the King Kong legacy, and, and it's essentially a racist legacy, and really, um, I always, you know, heard, you know, from people who try to, um, expo uh, make, you know, expositation. GPS signal the, lost. What's the word? Uh, expository. I don't remember the word now. Um, expositated, expositation. I don't remember the word. I'm so, so dumb. Um, of King Kong often said the opposite, that really it was an anti-racist movie because it was saying, you know, um, and, 
and in real, but in reality, like one video said, I'm not going to get into it because, like, one video pointed out that by calling King Kong racist, in a way, is more racist, <laughs> and so that's why I'm not going to touch that. Um, you know, by accusing it of ra accusing the film of racism is really more racist than the film itself. And so, for that reason, I'm just going to leave well enough alone um, as far as that's concerned. But again, this is a movie that really does not have too many deep things. You know, it's not like, you know, Kurt Siadmak, you know, he, was, he, he ran away from the Holocaust and everything. So, like, when he wrote The Wolfman, he was actually, you know, he actually had certain things in mind um, when he was writing the film. Um that were beyond, you know, the simple meaning of the film. And that's not something that you really have, you know, according to um, the makers of King Kong, that was not in the original King Kong. Now, this movie, it seems like that environmental message is intentional. It's not something that we're reading into it. Um, and it's an anti-human, and also it's, it, it, it does run against the biblical worldview. On the other hand, that was, you know, as far as the uh, period setting, it fits kind of well, because in the 70s, that was kind of the ideology of the time. And so, historically speaking, it's an anti-biblical worldview fits into a movie that's supposed to take place in the 70s, meaning that's the worldview of these people, not necessarily the worldview of the filmmakers. But on the other hand, there is, you know, it, it, there is kind of the allegory here between, which is kind of troubling and kind of disturbing, um, and giving what to think about was, you know, how, uh, how Jackson's character, how Samuel L. Jackson's character was, hated Kong and wanted to kill him. And the reason was because Kong killed his men. And so, it's a value of human life over animal life, and it is, in a way, it's really a biblical value that an animal that kills a human is liable to the death penalty, in a biblical worldview. Um, I'd call Chayad Roshenu, I will... In a quarter mile, at the traffic circle, take the second exit onto Seven Bridge Road. I will require the blood of, from any living thing, meaning if an animal kills a man, the animal deserves to die. On the other hand, um, they go to save Kong. I mean, the thing was, was that essentially it wouldn't be necessary. It, it, nothing would be gained by killing Kong. You know, that's the first aspect, you know, killing Kong is not going to bring these men back. And also, right, they were trying to find Chapman. When I saw the movie at the beginning, I thought he was the chaplain. Exit the traffic circle onto Seven Bridge Road. Which is said, it originally excited me, but the thing Continue was... Continue on Seven Bridge Road for a half mile. I didn't see anything to indicate he was a chaplain, and then I saw, you know, his name said Chapman, not Chaplin. So, um... You know, I thought maybe there would be some religious aspect, but it wasn't. Um, uh, but, you know... In, in a quarter mile, turn right onto Milford Road. You know, there there were issues there of, was, you know, was Samuel L. Jackson actually caring about Chapman, or was he just caring about getting, getting the... Uh, weapons, taking revenge, what was actually going on here, um, you know, so there's... Turn right onto Milford Road, Milford Road, U.S. Business 209, then turn left onto Pennsylvania 402 North. There are some complicated issues here, um, another complicated issue related to that, though, was how they wanted to save 
Kong um, from him, from Samuel Jackson, and what's the turn sig- left onto Pennsylvania what's 402 the significance North. Of that? And the main significance, though, was that the skull, cr- you know, there. You know, their fear was that... Continue on Pennsylvania 402 North for 25 miles. Would Kong then go and uh, and eventually show up on their doorstep, as, as uh, John Goodman's character said, and then that would be, um, you know, that's the reason why they wanted to destroy Kong. But the fact was, was Kong was protecting the people from the skull crawlers. So therefore, it's still a humanist and a human-centered reason for kill, for saving Kong, not just because of the inherent value of Kong, even though he's an animal, but rather because his role in the ecosystem is one that comes to benefit humanity. And so, I think that in a way also, you know, discusses the issues of, you know, bigger and smaller issues in general and ethics. Um, so there is a certain depth to that, you know. I mean, what comes to mind is um, the bombing of Hiroshima and perhaps also Nagasaki of how the ethics of that event were um, were essentially because it wound up saving more people in the long run because more people including Japanese people would have been killed if not for that event and so the difficulty of that choice and the essential morality of the choice um, was you know very vital and so the same thing here the question of the morality of well do we destroy Kong because he destroyed humans well why did he destroy humans was he acting in self-defense that really doesn't matter that much in the in a biblical worldview but as far as the fact that here Kong was essentially uh, a protector of humankind and protecting the people from the skull crawlers, that therefore made his life valuable, even from a moral point in the biblical worldview. Um, so that's definitely um, you know, a possibility here. Um, the ending is, is touching and nice and uh, Made is a feel-good ending. The uh, you know that stinger at the end, you know, hinting to the Toho monsters coming out, Godzilla and Rodan and Mothra and, and Ghidra. I know they're gonna call it King Ghidorah. I still like to call it Ghidra. Um, uh, so that's definitely something to look forward to. It's something that's you know. Enjoyable and um, something to look forward to. So, all in all, you know, and if you talk about it and you think about it, there is a certain level of depth to this movie. Um, but for the most part, it's just a fun little B movie. I mean, a lot of those B movies had depth. You know, look at a movie like um, *He Conquered the World*. A lot of the Corman movies, you know, had some kind of message. *He Conquered the World* is a perfect example. Even *Teenage Caveman* to a certain extent. Um, you know, so and and really even um, the social commentary of his three comedies um, were topical and interesting as well, you know, particularly A Bucket of Blood, to a lesser extent, A Little Shop of Horrors, but he did, he, even though um, that's the most popular of them because it was remade, it was a musical, um, the original was not a musical, um, but also in a, in a way, um, Creature from the Haunted Sea, uh, which really, you know, very low budget movie, it's just basically rehashing the same idea, which really essentially is based on 
other scripts that, that Corman had used and that Arkoff used and others used uh, previously at, at uh, American International. So, uh, you know, there's a lot going on here, a lot to talk about. So, in a way, it, it, it is still an homage to, you know, the Corman-esque approach to filmmaking. GPS signal lost. Um, so, you know, I, I could continue talking about this for a while, but we've already gone on for 45 minutes. Um, so thank you for watching, or at this point listening, uh, which is probably better, because there's not much to see. Um, and please like, share, and subscribe, and, uh, you know, put more, you know, let's continue this discussion in the comments, because, uh, I think it's a fun thing to talk about. It's definitely a, a fun discussion, and, um, you know, since Dark Corners didn't want to touch it, um, I do, though, uh, highly recommend Dark Corners. If you're a fan of, of you know, bad old movies, uh, you know, mostly horror and sci-fi, not exclusively, but mostly, um, B and lower movies, not always, but, and they do have some, you know, classic movie commentaries that are quite interesting and serious, as well as their comedic, um, almost Mystery Science Theater 3000-esque, um, reviews. They're out of London. They're just really great, so I just want to make a shout-out to, uh, Dark Corners, if you're a fan of these, you know, these type of movies, check them out, it's a, it's their, the videos are funny, they're well done, high production values, not like mine, and they are short, also not like mine, um, so it's definitely a lot of fun, if you're looking for something a bit longer, also funny, um, from Canada, you got Brandon Tenholt's uh, reviews, his are generally a bit longer, about 20 minutes, sometimes a half hour, also very interesting, very funny, um, and also, I don't know, there's a certain, you know, what, the one he talks about when he was a kid, because we're about the same age, you know, and watching these movies on, like, Monster Vision on TNT, which is exactly how I saw them, and those type of discussions really, um, you know, touch my heart, so it, you know, reminds me of, you know, being a little, you know, 10-year-old kid, you know, taping these shows late night, you know, setting up the VCR to tape these movies late at night on TNT and TBS and Sci-Fi Channel and, and all of that, you know, back when, you know, back in those days, um, just, you know, brings back good memories, so that's something, you know, that I enjoy about Brandon Tennell's uh, reviews, and both of them reference quite often Mystery Science Theater 3000, um, and we're looking forward to the new uh, Mystery Science Theater 3000. I'm, I'm being stoked to be disappointed, and hopefully I won't be disappointed. I remember, um, there's a video of when we met Joel, it was actually the second time we met him, we met Joel Hodgson at Monster Bash, like I mentioned earlier in the film, in this video, and we were, first of all, we were exhausted because we just drove all the way to Pittsburgh, and we were just taken away, and he was just basically there for us. It was like, you know, it was Sunday already, he was just hanging out with us, and it was just like, we're hanging out with Joel from Mystery Science Theater 3000, like, we were both, like, totally blown away, and the first, when we came in, we were hanging out with him, and then... A few hours later, he just, like, called us over and started doing magic tricks and stuff, and, like, we got the video of that, and it was awesome, and I remember, and he remembered us, I mean, I guess he doesn't see too many Hasidic Jews, you know, coming to him, but, like, we saw him at Cinematic Titanic maybe a year earlier, uh, at least six months, it was either six months earlier or a year and a half earlier, I don't remember, my memory's not that good right now, but that night, you know, we were in line, and we got the autographs from everybody, and, like, we were also exhausted. We wasn't as far away. It was only in Philly, um, which is, you know, and, and Joel lives in the Philly area. Um, but then, uh, excuse me, and meet him there in Pittsburgh, and he remembered us, excuse me, and he said, 
there's going to be the new Mystery Science Series 8000. I said, oh, you mean um, uh, Other Space, which was the Yahoo series that he did together with Trace Beaulieu. And he said, no, no, there's going to be a new Mystery Science Series 8000. And I'm, you know, you know, I, 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 I Jonah Ray, I don't know, I kind of have a, a love-hate thing with Jonah Ray, I don't know, some of, especially, like, uh, some of his jokes are kind of anti-Semitic, but, you know, usually I'm able to laugh at myself enough, um, but that, that usually doesn't bother me, somehow it brought me the wrong way, which is not typical of me, but then, um, uh, I posted my feelings on Twitter of how I felt like, um, this is going to be like when Poochie shows up, you know, on the Itchy and Scratchy show, and, um, comic book guy in The Simpsons, he's like, worst episode ever, and then Bart is like, you know, they've given you years of entertainment for free, and who are you to judge, type of thing, and the thing is, well, you know, with uh, kick, Kickstarter, um, wasn't not for free. Now, now we're paying for it, and we're paying for Netflix. But whatever, we're not paying that much, and it's still pretty much for, basically for free. You know, and we, we have we have Netflix even without Mystery Science here. So, looking forward to Mystery Science here 2000. Just a little over two weeks away. Um, that'll be a nice Holomaya treat. Uh, Simkusiantiv. And, um, and, and I saw the, uh, the trailer for that and had Reptilicus. So, um, that's pretty cool, Reptilicus. Uh, because I love that movie. Uh, that's one that I bought on VHS when I was a kid. I used to watch over and over again. And I, yeah, I especially love the, like, Copenhagen travel log, you know, showing, you know, the, the Little Mermaid uh, statue and stuff. Just like, you know, yeah, monsters attacking, but let's, you know, take a tour of the city, you know? Like, I don't know, that's just, there's something very special about that. Um, Dark Corners and Reptilicus ones. I don't think Brandon Tennell did it yet, so maybe uh, someday. Don't, um, but I'm, I'm looking for, I, you know, I was wondering why Rift Tracks never did Reptilicus. And they're bound to do it now, it seems, I'm thinking, because, you know, there's a few movies that both Cinematic Titanic and Rift Tracks did. Well, the only one I can really think of is Santa Claus Conquers the Martians. And that one was also a Mystery Science Theater episode. Um... You know, and it's considered like one of the essential Mystery Science Theater 3000 episodes. So I'm wondering if maybe now that the new Mystery Science Theater is doing Reptilicus, um, will uh, will Rift Tracks do Reptilicus? I don't know. That would be interesting. Um, they did Mothra. That was fun, and I'm disappointed that that won't be released. Um, you know, for download because that's uh, for or for streaming, or whatever. Because that was pretty cool, um, and it surprises me because uh, Mill Creek Entertainment has a release of Mothra. So if they were able to get the rights to release Mothra on a, a DVD set with two Ray Harryhausen movies and the Giant Claw, it's basically all Columbia Pictures movies uh, or Columbia Pictures releases. I mean, that's a Toho movie. Mothra was released by Columbia. Um, how was that Mill Creek Entertainment was able to get the rights to release that on DVD and Riff Tracks doesn't, wasn't able to? I mean, I would, I, you know, I would pay a little extra, you know, like, instead of regularly, you know, $10 for a Riff Tracks feature, I would pay like 15 you know, to give, you know, whatever to Toho or to uh, Columbia. So I'm, I'm surprised why they're not letting that be released, but whatever, I don't know. You know, uh, uh, the past couple of months, Shout Factory TV had a bunch of Godzilla movies, and now they're not up anymore. And I'm kind of disappointed because there's not that many original Godzilla movies, or really any Godzilla movies that are being streamed um, for free. You know, anywhere or places that you that I'm already subscribed to. Um, 
and there used to be a lot more and like they seem to be up and I don't know you know you always got to search but it was pretty cool when Shout Factory, Shout Factory TV is one of my favorite Roku channels and definitely probably the best free Roku channel I mean other than just YouTube you know and uh, what do you call it? Pluto TV is great you know because it's like a regular TV channel a bunch of TV channels but um, sometimes it skips you know whatever but this um, what do you call it? Uh, Shout Factory TV. If you have Roku or just online, awesome, awesome channel. You got Mystery Science Series 3000, of course, amazing. Uh, a whole bunch of episodes of Mystery Science Series 3000 on ShoutFactoryTV.com for free. A uh, 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 plethora, of maybe just about half of all the episodes are up there. Um, so that's great. It also has um, the film crew, which was the precursor to Rift Tracks. Pretty cool. It has, there were four episodes. It has three of them up. GPS signal lost. I don't know why it doesn't have the, the Killers from Space one, which is my favorite one. Um, but also Weird Al, the Weird Al show, the Saturday morning cartoon Weird Al show, which was only like 14 episodes, which is basically like <coughs> Al, like a Pee Wee's Playhouse type of show. That's a lot of fun. And also the, um, I think the Complete Al is also on there, uh, which is also awesome. I, I'm kind of looking forward to the uh, complete works of Weird Al coming out soon. But also some old movies, which are great, and a lot of other things which are fun. Get all the Gamera movies and uh, Jerry and Sylvia Anderson, you know, puppet shows, which are fun. Uh, but what I really love is some of the best sitcoms from the 50s, namely Dobie Gillis, awesome, Car 54, awesome, and the original Dennis the Menace, who also we met at uh, Monster Bash a few years ago, the same time Joel was there, awesome, I know, my wife always talks about how we met, was Dennis, the, the guy who played Dennis the Menace, Jane North, and the one who played Margaret, I don't remember her name, she's a chiropractor now, um, they were there together, and we, and they were just about to leave, and we were like, can you tell us about Gail Gordon? <laughs> you know, that's the kind of nerds that we are. And, and then they were like, you know what? Joseph Kearns was also on our Miss Brooks. I know. All right, whatever it is. Um, so whatever. I'm probably boring a lot of you, but if you made it this far, I give you a lot of credit. Um, please like, share, and subscribe. Uh, I know I really went off on a tangent here. It's we're almost up to the hour point, so I can't imagine anyone's going to listen to anything more. So, well, thank you for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe. God bless. And please um, tell us in the comments whatever you want to talk about um, with what we discussed this evening. All right, thank you for watching and listening. Really, especially if you made it this long. Um, and uh, enjoy. Thank you.